Hello, I'm Will. Welcome to Research Pod. Based on what we know about our audience, there is a 65% chance that you are listening to this on a mobile phone. As a tool, mobile devices have become pervasive in reach and constant in attention. What role does that availability have as a cause of, and potential solution to, the mounting crises of mental health and care sector staffing? And who falls between the cracks where technology falls short? Dr. Diane Wepper from Charles Darwin University joins us again, alongside Dr. Jabin from the University of Bradford, to talk tech, therapy, and professional care. As a note, this interview includes discussion of suicide and isolation, so listener discretion is advised. And joining me from Charles Darwin University is Dr. Diane Wepper, and from the University of Bradford, Dr. Jabin. Hello to the both of you. Hello. Hello, Will. For listeners who have joined us in our previous episode, we'll know a bit about Dr. Diane Wepper already, but uh, Jamin, if you'd mind, give us just a few words about yourself. I'm Dr. Muhammad Shafiq Rahman Jabin. Just call me Dr. Jabin, that's fine. My field of expertise is cognitive system engineering, root code analysis, also incident reports, quality improvement, patient safety, and various types of systematic reviews. And I am an assistant professor in public health at the Faculty of Health Studies right now in the University of Bradford. I'm also skilled in medical engineering, specializing in medical imaging and devices, and also have information technology systems, and also skilled in cognitive system engineering, and also have 11 years of professional teaching experience in various dynamic education environments, including adult education, teaching experience in university and higher secondary school. The university teaching includes several health informatics and public health related courses, undergraduate and postgraduate levels, both. Jarbin and I first met at the University of South Australia, and I was coordinating a course called First People's Health, which is a first year course within the Bachelor of Nursing and Midwifery and Allied Health. And Jarb was one of the teaching team, and I was really pleased to have him join us because he was able to bring a multicultural lens to working with First Peoples in Australia. And so from there, I moved to the UK, to the University of Bradford. And then a short while, while later, Jarbin joined me as well in the public health team. And so we've collaborated ever since and with his focus on digital technologies and health informatics and our shared interest around improving health and well-being for people. Just to add on Diane's comments, what I would say that, yes, she has already given the background of our history and been joining up and our collaboration as well. I would say that the entire idea of my research interest is based on the statement made by one of the health informatics experts in Australia named Enrico Coeira. And what he states is that the very first rule of informatics tells us to start with clinical problem we want solved rather than the technology we want to build. So that is the sort of things that actually helped me and Diane to come together and work on what would we like to do in future, particularly from her field, the mental health perspective. And my field is health informatics or digital health or health information technology systems. Or for example, we are currently talking about something called a mobile app in, for suicide prevention. So this is something that, you know, joining us together, I would say. Yes, let's delve right into that. The main thrust of today's conversation and in our interview is examining mental health in a global context. I imagine it's been a rough couple of years for mental health in a global context. The world has undergone several seismic shifts and it's continuing to change at a rapid pace and people are very connected and we hear a lot about people's well-being. We see a lot of that instability in society and in people. And from your perspective, with that the academic mindset, what do you see as the state of the world in terms of global mental well-being, especially Javin, in relation to how technology and social media and apps are providing either connection or instability in a very, very quickly changing world? Uh, maybe, Diane, if you want to start off with some of the, the general psych stuff. Oh, sure. I think uh, we're never going to go back to pre-pandemic times. I think the world has moved, you know, good or bad from that experience because it really has changed a lot of our behaviours in terms of how we work, you know, how we engage with each other, even how we travel. 
And so I think the digital space has probably moved along a lot faster than it would have if we didn't have the pandemic, because we say we're a connected globe you know, at the moment. And I think the pandemic brought that along a lot quicker than it should have. It was tracking along at a certain speed, and I just think it exponentially escalated because of the pandemic. Would you add to that, Jarbin? Yeah, uh, I'm not a big expert of mental health, but what I would say, just to have the connection, what Diane has just said now, for example, over the past nine years, my research interests focus exclusively on combining the fields of health information technology, which I would say abbreviation is HIT, systems to solutions and their management in healthcare, particularly with the focus to quality of care and patient safety. So patient safety is my concern. During my PhD, what we find, although a host of mainly technical problems were expected, so more than half, which is 58%, of the issues were identified to be generated by failures of human performance. So human factors were found to cause more deleterious effects than technical factors. So, for example, six instances of severe patient harm, four were triggered by human factors, including two patient deaths. So in this term, this is where that I and Dan would connect, you know, in terms of our expertise and build probably a new research focus area that we have been working on and we would like to see a new field of area that we can build on. Could I ask you to tell me just a bit about the national and international rates of incidents and strategies towards suicide, self-harm, and how much they reflect that changing social media technology use? Is there anything that's related to, you know, those kids on their phones being at more risk or having a higher incidence, or is it an intergenerational thing? Such a complex question, isn't it? And it does require a bit of detail in the response. And so if we start in England, 5,275 deaths by suicide occurred in England in 2022. So that's the equivalent of 10.6 suicides per 100,000 people. That's according to the Office of National Statistics. And so uh, I must take my hat off to England because the launch of the Suicide Prevention Strategy and Action Plan in October the 10th, 2023, was wonderful because it was looking at a whole system approach and not just uh, locating suicide in the health sphere or education or the workforce. And so if you go to the website on gov.uk, you can download the Suicide Prevention Strategy Action Plan. And there are many, many areas that the government wants to do to address suicide prevention, because I think they do recognise that there are many risk factors, as you said, you know, uh, young people on their phones and, and we're so connected. So you can't just make that one variable. It could be a contributing factor. And the uh, government have... Uh, taken that on board very seriously and put £100 million towards the action plan. And that that is really, really wonderful. And I think uh, related to that, uh, as we are talking about young people, there's an online safety bill in England that is still not uh, translated into legislation just yet. And a key debate within the bill is a term we call legal but but harmful and so the question remains like will families have to deal with children who die by suicide as a result of this safety bill come, online safety bill coming into effect so what instigated that was the death of a 14 year old girl molly russell in 2017 after she saw content about suicide and self-harm and that catapulted her story into british history so her father ian russell later found after she died that his daughter had engaged in pinterest and instagram over 130 times a day and saved images of young people cutting themselves and sharing ideas about self-harm and the online safety bill it's been in draft since 2019, and it's publicized as a promise to help keep children safe and tackle online abuse. So the premise, legal but harmful, is hotly contested by companies like Meta, who own Pinterest and Instagram, and they're required to remove harmful content. So legal but harmful currently only applies to adults engaged in online content and focuses on buyer beware. That only requires companies to alert the customer to harmful material. 
and content promoting self-harm is explicitly identified in the bill along with the physical and psych psychological harm. And online search warrants, a last minute addition to the bill advocated by Ian Russell and the Molly Russell Foundation is seen as a win for families. And so even though there's all this activity, there's like 10,000 apps online that are meant to help people with mental health distress. And yet people like Molly were still not protected from social media platforms that cause more harm than good with their algorithms that follow the young person. Just to add on Diane's statistics and explanation, I would say that more than 700,000 people actually lose their life to suicide every year. And the world is not on track to reach the 2030 suicide reduction targets by WHO, World Health Organization. So WHO do advocate for countries to take action to prevent suicide. And ideally, that should be through a comprehensive national suicide prevention strategy. Government and communities can contribute to suicide prevention by implementing Live Life or WHO's approach in order to start suicide prevention so that countries can build on it and further to develop a comprehensive national suicide prevention strategy. Also, the guide is for all the countries with or without national suicide prevention strategy. So national or local focal points for suicide prevention, mental health, alcohol, etc., and also community stakeholders should come together with a vested interest or may already be engaged, probably. So they should come together in order to implement suicide prevention activities. Yeah, to add to that, Australia's suicide prevention plan expired in 2023 and they haven't renewed it. And the New Zealand suicide prevention strategy expires in 2024. So I think there's a watch and wait approach happening, at least with those two countries in terms of England's very bold approach to this this issue. And so I do think there are some really good takeaways that the other countries could easily implement from the UK strategy. For example, reducing the amount of paracetamol people can buy in shops would be one approach, like a quick win. And whether, you know, the school curriculum could have suicide and self-harm prevention workshops. So in England, they're looking to have half the schools have mental health support teams, for example, in place by April 2025, and then all state schools after that. And so those sorts of strategies and actions can actually be achieved quite quickly. Yeah. And then it goes through to middle-aged men as well. They're a bit harder to reach because it's interesting. We tend to think young people, don't we, when we hear of this topic. But in the UK, at least, it's the top killer of men is by death by suicide. And even just the language, it's death by suicide, not committed suicide. So that would be, even in the discourse of all of us, we could change the language around it. Although the online safety bill does actually make it still illegal to die by suicide. So, you know, there's a bit of an anomaly <laughs> there. Well, to flip my previous question on its head, when we talk about global approaches, the global platforms, to look at the community-led approach, individuals or very small, close communities, is there much in the way of technology-led initiatives there? Uh, Diane, I'm wondering if we can draw on any of your experience and research working with Indigenous Maori communities in New Zealand, or if there's any other First Nations Indigenous Peoples initiatives that would be worth highlighting here? Yes, some research I've been doing recently around what's called the digital divide. And so from a mental health perspective, that is actually a contributing factor towards feelings of loneliness and isolation. And this was very much highlighted during lockdown. And so if we look at the um, what is the digital divide, it's basically the gap between those who have access to technology and having the confidence to use technology compared to those without it due to social factors such as race, gender, education or location. So in my New Zealand study, I interviewed Indigenous populations in very remote areas because they have less access because of the lack of the, like cell phone towers, for example, to access their healthcare services. And it was really interesting. I thought it would be all very negative, the findings, which which it is, of course. <laughs> However, the resilience, which we talked about last time on ResearchPod, came through, especially with the older population, and that they were actually 
able to adapt to their remoteness with digital technology. So that's not to say, oh, well, that's fine. You know, people in remote areas are hardy and they can cope because that's a narrative as well. Although we did find that the sense of community is a lot stronger in a lot of these communities. So they will be more creative in terms of, for example, in the study I did, they would go to a local school to use their internet access if they weren't able to have it in their individual homes. And they would use their strong cultural connections with each other to rely on the intergenerational approach of having younger people if they if they live there to assist with them. So I think it's interesting that we think some communities may not be that resilient or be able to access digital technologies, but that I think it really does depend on the sense of connectedness that already exists within especially First Nations communities. In one of the studies, recent study that I and Dan we have been doing, what we found is that there is a wish for a better healthcare system to access healthcare needs and information by the Moray people. So there is a clear need for communication improvements and a better system in the place. And particularly, it happened during the COVID, you know. So they would like to reach the healthcare providers in a more accessible way. So they expect the use of information and information sharing hubs could be better utilized. And for community links, that could help their work and the clients as well. So, yeah. Yes, and that piece of work Jarvan and I are doing right at the moment, we're yet to put the article together, that's to develop a proof of concept digital solution, especially for those communities. Because when I was in New Zealand in February, Cyclone Gabriel hit the country. So the major city, Auckland, and then my small region on the east coast of the North Island, Hawke's Bay, we had no cell phone towers for like a week. So people couldn't use their phones besides the electricity being cut off. So it was really interesting time to be interviewing participants during that stressful time because I was interviewing them about the pandemic and how they were coping with the digital issues back then. And then we just happened to be in the middle of a a cyclone. And so they were very kind to me and they still took part in the interviews. And so what is coming out of that now is, a, a like Jarvin says, that the people want a digital solution that isn't relying on the internet. So is there something you can download on your phone that perhaps has your basic identifying information or health information that is saved in your phone so you could bring it up maybe as an image that doesn't need to go to the internet? So if you have to go to a pop-up clinic or pharmacy and prove your identity or your health condition, there would be something there uh, that you don't have to verbally, especially for elderly people, tell them all of your information because in Australia and New Zealand, you know, we don't have an NHS, so there's no one health system. So it's a lot of manual handling around health information. So I think that would be really exciting the next stage for Jarvan and I to seek out funding to look at a proof of concept digital solution that would probably be an app or QR code that goes somewhere, you know, to gather your information. And you'd have to look at the privacy issues as well. And um, we'd like to pilot that with probably a small health provider in New Zealand to get, you know, permission. And then look at, yeah, how does that person carry around that digital wallet, as it were, of their health information that doesn't necessarily rely on connectivity to be used. Now, we touched on something there with the towers. And Jabin, if I could ask you to just go over a few points on separating in technological terms, the hardware, software, apps, commercial versus medical devices. When we talk about technology in health, what are some of the the scopes of these terms here? Yeah, so from my PhD study, what my research explored is the HIT, which is Health Information Technology, software and hardware technology, both, and how informatics help them work. The merging of these fields fits best because the advent and the rapid advances in HIT system has made the entire healthcare a truly complex socio-technical system than ever before. So what I would say, no matter what changes are introduced, whether human or technical component in such complex system like healthcare, no matter what, new, unforeseen, unexpected problems always arise. So while in Australia, the research during my doctoral degree was based on approach of learning from failures, examining things that had gone wrong, particularly in relation to HIT systems used in medical imaging. So our idea was to form a basis to prevent and manage similar problems in future. 
and that focused on identifying and characterizing healthcare quality and safety issues by collecting and analyzing already existing incidents or adverse events reports. So the impact, what I would say, for example, although a host of mainly technical problems was expected, as I said earlier during my interview, more than half of the issues were identified by contributed by human factors. So the appreciation of the bigger picture was necessary to address the underlying mechanism of those issues as commissioning to a new HID system or properly embedding an existing system can have enormous implications for both staff and patients. When I talk about the underlying factors, it's not very common for the layman terms. And the underlying factors mostly lie in the software-related issues. For example, system configuration interface with other software systems or components, software functionality, data storage and backup, record migration, software not accessible or not available, network server down or slow, etc. So these are the underlying factors that from a layman perspective is not very well understood most of the time. So when I was doing my research and I found that these terms are very complicated even for the healthcare professionals and they don't need to be actually uh, very much an expert on these hardware and software issues. But what I come up is that they do need a robust training facilities so that the healthcare professionals and in the wider context like the end users, whoever use these apps or technology, they need training. Yeah, they need to be trained well. What I would say in terms of the incident reporting systems, I would say, that would comprise e-prescribing issues as well. So we would like to suggest a unit-based reporting system since each healthcare department has its own type of problems at the local level. So because the HIT systems are interconnected to each department, the provision of these HIT incidents should be made at early stage. So therefore, we would emphasize on ensuring a standard incident reporting system at the national level and even for suicide prevention as well. So the incident reporting system in the UK, for example, has been centralized with the National Patient Safety Agency. But in countries like Sweden, I haven't seen that there is a lack of standard reporting system. The structure of healthcare incident reporting systems varies locally, regionally and nationally. For example, they have different incident reporting systems and which are decentralized using different digital systems such as Synergy, Platina, Lisa, etc. So these incident reporting systems are not liable to any accustomed healthcare quality standard, also causing being under operational oversight of the system used in the healthcare. So we would like to propose a resolution is that it can be resolved by reinforcing the quality standard of the incident reporting systems at the national level. And probably a viable management is the only way that we could overcome the challenges encountered at regional levels. So yes, in order to respond Diane's about the e-prescribing system, so the issues of the e-prescribing system, which also part of HID incidents issues, so that could also be done if we particularly focus on the management of incident reporting systems uh, in this way, the way that I say it now. Well, to pick up on something, Dan, that you mentioned towards the end of your previous answer, it seems to be leading quite neatly towards the Strength Within Me app from the 2020 paper. I ask you to fill in some of the details about that in terms of a quick methodology, some of the scope and assessment, and how the connectivity of that one app to other social media platforms was useful, informative, open, perhaps more research questions? Sure. The app is considered one of the better apps alongside the American military have an app too called, you may have heard of the movie, The Hurt Locker, and they have an app called The Hope Box. So it's a play on word, yeah, Hope Box. And so the themes that come through with these very successful apps, such as Strength Within Me app and the Hope Box app, is that the engagement with the user is very high. And so they tend to have like avatars. You can develop your phone tree, as it were. It's very, you can personalize it. So you can have people identified that you have like a traffic like system. So say if you're feeling okay in a good mood, you could push the button and with a thumbs up 
So it's like a self-check-in that your mood is okay. And then that can actually go to your therapist or your support person, caregiver. And then if you're not feeling that great, but just want people to know, mm, I'm not that great, you can you know, you push another button that's sort of like an amber alert almost. And then, of course, then the red means I really need help. And then it can engage you with the um, the phone numbers that you want to to ring people. And so I think, yeah, that app is very, very good and is working more towards co-design with the service users. So the, the 10,000 apps that I reviewed, none of them use true co-design methodology. You would have focus groups, say, or end users would be involved in the testing of an app, that kind of thing, but they weren't involved end to end. So from the very beginning of there's an issue, we need to help and, you know, working right through. And so the research that I did with the University of Bradford group uh, service users, or they, they like the name experts by experience, they preferred that term, has been very positive. And so we've all published the articles that have come out of our study. And that's, again, working towards a proof of concept for digital solutions for suicide prevention, because a lot of apps, they're created, but then there's no way to evaluate them. Like, does the person feel better and then they no longer use it? So that's a sign of success. Or is there a way to evaluate it? And the best kinds of apps, such as Strength Within Me app, have a therapist that works with the person. So it really is better if there's a mental health provider involved in that app. And then they introduce the app to a person. So it's done in a, you know, a team collaborative way as opposed to people randomly just downloading apps and hoping for the best. So I think you do need some sort of professional partnership for these apps to really work. We're talking about the pointy end of mental health as in suicide prevention, not necessarily mood type of apps that you know track your mood Um, that's okay however you know you want more than just signposting to a website or phone number you when you want to talk to someone or even use the chat function we found that in our research that people said to me this experts by experience if I go online I want to stay online I don't want to be signposted to somewhere else so the use of peer support workers that can go on the chat function is seen as very important. And the Samaritans are very active in that space. They have a very good website and, you know, that sort of functionality. So I think it's all about keeping people engaged as well as some signposting, but, you know, it it needs more than just one solution. Just to add on that, I'd suggest that what I would say that we need a panel of experts to review those apps that have been designed to help patients and also experience suicidal ideation. So for each of the app, there should be guidance on several background factors practitioners should also consider when recommending apps for the patients. And uh, most importantly, I would say panel of psychologists should share their own ratings, probably reviews and thoughts for the apps which are already in the market today. So I think this would sort of ease the ratings of app or evaluation of app, what Diane was talking about so far now. Well, that leads on to the notion of the next generation of technology in apps, in things like generative AI chatbots for therapeutic services. And this is something that is being trialed, is being deployed by certain companies and on certain services already. Do you see there being a want or need or a use case for those? Would you feel comfortable with them being a prominent part of future strategy response? I think from my perspective, we must lean in towards these new technologies. They're not going away, but we do need safeguarding around them as well. Yeah, because people are turning to generative AI for all sorts of things. Although the chatbots, I think the feedback I've had is that a person wants a real person to be chatting with. Because you can tell the chatbots, you know, they, they're they not really going to be 100% human-to-human contact. And so I think the approach of having peer support workers who are online chatting with someone is the ideal. Although I think the AI could probably help triage the conversation somewhat. And with the suicide prevention strategy in England, they're actually introducing training to people that work in like the pensions department because they're finding that people who are lonely and more marginalized in society, if they're talking to someone about their financial situation, you know, they're fearing heading towards suicidal thoughts or behaviors, 
the conversations can actually be picked up by the workers that are on the front line in those departments. So that's kind of like a hidden area. We don't think necessarily about people picking up on that in those departments, those government departments. And so there's going to be some training, a two-day like mental health first aid training for government workers who deal with the marginalised populations and, and then know where to support them to seek out that help. And there's meant to be some technologies behind that so that the phone conversations pick up key words. And so if they bring up a red flag, then that helps the person on the phone know where to navigate that person. So I'd say AI would help in that sense to pick up and hear key phrases that would be otherwise missed by the human ear, especially if someone's not trained in that area. So I think those first line responders would probably benefit from AI as a tool. Yeah, I, I've heard in news a Belgian man who recently died by suicide after chatting with an AI chatbot on an app called Chai. So I'm not quite sure about how it would fit, how it would be effective. But as I said earlier, even though I have the expertise of technology, but I mostly focus on not building more and more technologies, but rather than solving the problems, you know, around those technologies, which are already existing. For someone who needs to make changes in their lives, or someone whose choices could influence the lives of many other people, what should they know coming away from today's conversation and the research that you are all doing together? Going back to the England suicide prevention strategy with the whole systems approach, I actually think one of the takeaway messages today is if people seriously thought about doing the mental health first aid course, and you can either do the short one, so like three hours, which um, I went to that one as a health professional just to see what it would be like. And it was very well run. This was in Australia and it was run by St. John's. Other places run them, like universities run them as a uh, standard now. So the University of Bradford, I knew their student support surfers ran that. So I think as I said before, leaning in towards it, like instead of saying, oh, I wouldn't know what to do if someone said that they wish they didn't weren't living anymore, you know, those sort of statements or the world would be better off without them. So I think we could all take responsibility and be more educated about the um, factors that lead towards people having that sense of hopelessness because it really is a sense of hopelessness that makes people feel that they have no other option than to uh, take their own lives or self-harm. And so that would be something I think no matter who you are, if you were able to find an agency and a lot of them are free as well or in the workplace, basic mental health first aid course. And then there are the free phone numbers as well, Samaritans in UK and Ireland, free phone 116123. It's UK and Ireland, Samaritans, free phone 116123. And also in Australia, they have the Lifeline number 131114 and Lifeline. And New Zealand, it's um, 0800 Lifeline. So those are just the three examples there. If people feel that maybe listening to this session, they'd like to do more in that space. And so there are some sort of mantras as well that the experts by experience have really, I've felt quite humbled listening to their lived experience. And, you know, you may have heard it about nothing about us without us. And so that resonates no matter who you are as a person that we all consume health services somewhere along the track. And also another mantra <laughs> is um, looking, if, especially if you're a provider of health services, is focusing on the interaction, not the intervention. Sometimes it's actually the interaction that counts feeling heard as opposed to the intervention. So especially with health services, it might be you, you have the operation for the broken arm or something, you know, so you have the intervention or you receive the medication. But because we're human beings, it's the interaction that actually stays with us. And we remember the manner that someone spoke to us or the, you know, where they were just rude, <laughs> you know, so uh, you might be having a bad day, but, you know, all those little sort of we could even call them microaggressions uh, for some people. That's enough for them to feel a sense of hopelessness and then they're on this dark pathway to wanting to uh, self-harm. So just those little things would be great for the listeners to hear. And then the research that we're mentioning and we can provide the links. And also I, I can just see that the government of UK, they have Suicide Prevention Strategy Action Plan for next five years, 2023 to 2028. 
and that include development of a new nationwide near real-time suspected suicide surveillance system, also identifying opportunities to improve the quality of intelligence and the data that is used to improve the knowledge and uh, prevent suicide in that manner. Apart from the government, I would just add creating protective environments, for example, reducing access to lethal means or creating healthy organizational policies and culture as well, and also reduce substance use and community-based policy and practices. So community-based policies and practices is very important in, in this regard. And even the workforce, like our psychological safety, sometimes we as healthcare professionals worry so much about the people we serve and our own psychological safety sometimes is not always looked at. So there's more research in that space around nurses and thoughts of suicide. You know, something just came out the other day I was looking at. And so, you know, who cares for the carers? That's something we all need to be kinder to each other, which we did that in the pandemic, but we seem to have strayed away (laughs) from that somewhat. So I think we should also think of to cover mental health conditions within the health insurance policies and increasing provider availability in underserved areas or rural areas and also provide rapid and remote access to help. So this would create safer suicide care through systems change, I believe. Dr. Jabin, Dr. Dan, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Will.